Let's be honest, few humans enjoy meetings and many feel trapped in meetings. As leaders, we don't want to burden those we lead, but meetings can seem to do that more often than not. We wanted to address the pain of meetings through the Meetings with Saints Library. Here we have 15 plus presentations dedicated to improving the meetings we run. We have experts in the field addressing topics like getting people involved in meetings, staying on task, dealing with conflict in meetings, and a ton more. We'd love you to explore the full Meetings with Saints library over 14 days at no cost to you. You can do this by visiting leadingsaints.org 14. That's leadingsaints.org 14. We'll also give you access to all of our virtual libraries that educate about other leadership topics. It's really good stuff. So visit leadingsaints.org 14 or click the link in the show notes. Today, I'm on the campus of Brigham Young University chatting with Professor Joseph Spencer. How are you? Not bad. Thanks awesome. for having me. Yeah. yeah, this is great. I first was introduced to you last year during Education Week. My dad's like, you got to come listen to you know, Joseph Spencer. I'm like, I don't know who this guy is. He's talking about <laughs> Isaiah. I don't know, you know, but hey, give it a try. But I've never been in such an engaging lesson about the Isaiah chapters than, than what you presented. And, oh, and you could tell your passion of it all, <laughs> right? Like, you weren't uh, you weren't held hostage to do that lecture, I'm sure. No, no, <laughs> no. But I am passionate about this. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's cool. And so, like you're at BYU, like I, for a lot of academics, especially Latter Day Saints, I I kind of see this. This is like a, a dream for some people to yeah. be here to teach, you know, academics in the context of of the church and mm-hmm. to be in the religion department, and whatnot. When did you think I'm going to aim for a- <laughs> academia? Late in the game, that was not my plan at all. I thought about being a seminary teacher after I came back from my Mm. mission and decided after a couple of years, that was not where I wanted to go with things, but I had no idea where I was headed Mm. with things. My wife and I opened a bookstore, an independent bookstore in Eastern Washington for a time. Then I thought about going to library school. So I did a master's in library science, not thinking about academia at all, but I was beginning to write some things on the side, go to conferences occasionally. As I finished that master's degree, I had an invitation to teach a few classes in philosophy at Utah Valley University. Mm -hmm. And two weeks in that classroom, I thought, this is what I want to do. So then I decided to roll the dice, go to graduate school and studied philosophy. Um, Yeah. Nice. And was was there anything during your mission? Where did you serve your mission? California, Ventura Mission, Spanish speaking. I was Sacramento Spanish Ah, speaking. So California Spanish speaking, right? right? (laughs) Was there a moment in your mission where you thought, I really just enjoy this this teaching dynamic? Was there any, did that any play? Yeah. There? No, I fell in love with teaching in the mission field, which is why I was thinking about seminary and that kind of thing. But yeah, I just, and especially teaching scripture, mm-hmm. right? Just, wow, that yeah, it came to life for me. Of course, when I decided to get a PhD in philosophy, I was not planning on teaching in a religion department. I was yeah. planning on teaching philosophy somewhere, but this kind of came up as an option and I began exploring it and rolled the dice. Nice. Yeah. And if you were to go back to Elder Spencer back then and, and maybe teach him a few things about teaching from the scriptures with now this uh, experience that you do have, yeah. I mean, what, what advice would you give? Just general advice there. Holy heaven. I'd hope he'd be on a P-Day or something because we need a lot of time. <laughs> I think I had some things figured out, but not much. Yeah, yeah, I've learned a lot since then. But at the one thing I think I maybe had already gotten, but it, it's the thing I'd still tell myself even then and any young teacher is, my heavens, pay attention to the person you're teaching, right? Oh, yeah. That's what's landing is what matters here, right? Not just that you've got something to say. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a lot of content in the scriptures that you can just uh, riff on, right? And and take a left turn and and go for it. But uh, it's got to be applicable and and relevant for the person in front of you. Yep. Nice. So philosophy, that's not the typical (laughs) religion professor course here at BYU, right? It's not. In fact, I'm the only philosopher in the religion department at BYU. So, And what to... At what point, so you went, were going into philosophy, did you think you were going to teach philosophy? Yeah, that was yeah. my plan. Yeah. And I, I wasn't looking at religious education at BYU at all mm-hmm. at the time. I was writing things on scripture on the side. So I'm doing my philosophy work in graduate school, but I'm also writing things on the Book of Mormon or Latter-day Saint theology and these kinds of things. And that drew attention of a faculty member here. And mm-hmm. they reached out to me and said, are you interested in teaching? I was, what? This is not what I'm thinking about, but <laughs> maybe. And invited me to come out and teach for just a summer term and kind of get my feet wet and teaching the Book of Mormon every day that summer. I, was, I can't believe I could be paid to do yeah. this. So so yeah, so I began to put that into my plans and see if nice. it could play out. And 
I'll give a shout out to Anthony Sweat's team uh, with the Why Religion podcast. Yeah. We'll link to that episode recently where, where you were interviewed and you talked about Hugh Nibley. Yes. And he had a philosophy background. Is that right? Um, his degrees were not in philosophy, but he went to the university and went through the university system at a time when if you went to university, you studied philosophy. Oh, gotcha. So he okay. studied plenty of philosophy. Gotcha. You know? And then he had a, a short stint in the BYU religion department. But... He did. He, when he came to BYU, he had a double appointment. So uh, half of his time was spent teaching religion courses and half was in history. Mm, nice. Yeah. And so what the, generally speaking, like what different, how does that impact your approach to religious education? Does anything come to mind? Yeah, from top to bottom. It changes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, for me, the the reason I got interested in philosophy, which I discovered belatedly, I didn't, mm. if you had told me there was a thing really called philosophy in high school, I would have looked at you crazy, right? Yeah. But when I stumbled on it, what I saw in philosophy was a field where the aim is to get serious about the questions, right? Uh, and it felt to me like every other thing I was studying in college, it was like, we'd just get enough of an answer to get us satisfied and then we'd move on. But philosophy felt like it was really going to stay with the question. And that and that shapes a lot of the way I teach, the way I write, what I'm trying to do in my research and scholarship. I really want to, I'm so interested in getting the question right. And we'll see if we can get answers to it too, but I yeah. want to get the question right yeah. first. The other thing I found in philosophy right from the get-go is that philosophers are very serious about reading, not just reading a lot, but reading very carefully, picking out structures and arguments and all that kind of thing. And that has influenced my work in scripture and the way I teach just through and through. Yeah. And learning about, you know, first, second, Nephi and the, and the Isaiah chapters from you, like giving that a new perspective of realizing this is something that Nephi wrote years, decades after. Mm -hmm. He's not just journaling and writing day to day. And, and he had a, a strong purpose that really, you know, you talking about it's easy to default to the layman and Lemuel story, like the silly brothers. And, and it's easy to apply that to our lives. Like, I don't want to be a layman and Lemuel. I want to be a Nephi, right? But there, there's so much of a of a passion and almost a love letter of, of from Nephi yeah. in, in that journey that that we often miss, right? Exactly, yeah. And I mean, that's uh, in a lot of ways, that's what's so valuable about philosophy to me is that it makes me stay with the question long enough that I don't have just the easy applicable answer because mm -hmm. those are good answers and they're applicable, but there's also something deeper, something richer yeah. that if we stay with it a bit longer, there are questions we have that we're not even quite hearing ourselves ask. Yeah. So give us a, a philosophy advice to the average member who's sitting down with their weekly Come Follow Me lesson plan or their, their <laughs> reading schedule. And is there a way or tactics we could try to better stay with the question longer or, or seek the question rather than the answer? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's hard to know how to translate it into everyday language, but I would say at the very least, it's something like just slow way down. Mm. Our tendency is to read on the fly and we tend to read scripture a little more slowly than we read other things. But the slower we are and the more questions we can ask, we'll start to see what questions the prophets themselves are asking in scripture. So to make it, just to make that concrete, we tend to read a verse and we go, okay, I get it. I get the idea here. This is telling me to have faith. But if we stop and say, okay, well, it tells me to have faith, but how does it tell me to have faith? What mm -hmm. phrases does it use? What prepositions does it use? What verb does it choose? And why that rather than, and here's the other list of verbs, Nephi or Mormon or whatever could have used it starts to deepen the meaning of it. So it's that kind of slow reading, sticking with it, keep asking questions of it, and something starts to pop out. There's yeah. more there. Yeah, that's helpful. So I wanted to, you know, I, I was so intrigued by your education week lectures and whatnot. And I'm, as I, and part of going to education week is I find some great professors I can reach out to or, or speakers that could add some content to the Leading Saints audience. And Yours is what I'm like, wow, I really enjoy this, but I don't know how I'm going to shoehorn <laughs> Joseph Spencer into leadership. Sure. Um, but then I found out recently, about nine months ago, you were made a bishop. I was. And I, this is what I love about church leadership. It's like the great equalizer, like <laughs> the so philosopher, true. Joseph Spencer. All right. He's sitting in the seat. Not so easy, is it? No, <laughs> right? it is not. <laughs> how, how helpful is that PhD now? Right. But right, nonetheless, totally. uh, what's been just over these nine months like? What has stood out to you? What have you learned uh, just as far as the tradition of, of leadership in this, the lay ministry we have? Yeah, that is a great question. I mean, I think, and I'm still very young as a bishop, right? Very yeah. early in this process. But the first thing I feel like I've learned is my heavens, the structure is set up for a reason. And so I've tried to take very seriously what you find in the handbook and what uh, the guidance that's been given by the leaders of the church about how this is supposed to operate. And the result is I've really seriously taken this idea that my Relief Society president, my elders quorum presidents have certain responsibilities and they're theirs, not mine. 
and really making sure that happens. And I've got phenomenal <laughs> leaders in those positions, but it really means I have the freedom to do the kinds of things that the calling is laid out for. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's a temptation, oh, if I micromanage this and I make sure that's happening and I've got to text everyone 20 times to make sure everything's happening or something, but really genuinely trust this is that person's stewardship, yeah. not mine. We'll talk about it when the time is right. It has made all the difference in me being able to focus on what I'm really yeah. called to focus on. And what does that look like in practice as far as are there certain boundaries or do you kind of find yourself maybe verging into their lane a little bit? I mean, is there <laughs> any any practices you do to make sure that you are saying that's your world, this is my world, and, yeah. and just because I'm the bishop doesn't mean that I'm over everything per se? There are some things I've had to learn along the way. I mean, some of that is just signaling that over and over and the one of the things that, one of the places where I feel like I've been able to watch it happen is ward councils, because the temptation in ward council is for the bishop to sort of run the show, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that surprised me in becoming a bishop is the second I open my mouth on ward council, all eyes are on me. And the next 10 comments will all just reiterate what I've said oh, or yeah. something, right? Which made me realize really quickly, just, I needed to shut up, right? <laughs> just don't say as much, let people talk. And when I open my mouth, it's to say, I really like that thought, keep going, or I want other thoughts here. What are other people thinking about? And the more comfortable people have gotten, which I've watched happen, right? To where and there, I've had ward councils where I'm like, boy, I may not get a chance to say anything. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. But watching that happen, I think people feel a stronger sense of ownership for their own callings. They can recognize in a very real way right there, I'm trusting you. This is your responsibility. You bring to the table what you're working on, but don't expect me to come tell you what to do. Yeah. And this isn't the focus of our interview per se, but anything else uh, worth mentioning that you've learned or, or practices you found that have worked during your, your few months here as bishop? That's certainly the biggest one. I mean, I will say this, and this sounds a little strange because it could sound self-serving or something. The thing that scared me the most coming in, it turned out, I mean, not anticipatory, right? But once I was actually <laughs> in the calling, was how much moral authority people are willing to grant you as a bishop. Oh, and wow. I think this is probably true of a lot of leadership positions. Yeah. The first time I gave a talk in a sacrament meeting, the amount of attention and seriousness members of my ward gave to that talk frightened me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I've spoken in this ward, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, a half dozen times over the years, and no talk had, had, like, had been taken that seriously. And that kind of made me sit up and pay attention and is a kind of reminder that to be called into any leadership position, there's a lot of responsibility. What you say, what you do carries a certain weight that whether you want it or not, you have. And that, yeah. that was a wake-up call. Yeah, that's uh, something that you know, no handbook can really prepare you for. It's just sort of these these nuanced dynamics that you walk into and it's like, wow, like I got to really be thoughtful about what I'm talking about and how I'm talking about it. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's interesting. What about, and I'm always intrigued to get a religion professor perspective as far as the doctrine of repentance, especially mm -hmm. in that seat. Yeah. I often refer to it that, and I was this bishop, I just kind of felt like I was a spiritual parole officer, you know, like sure. uh, when was the last relapse or, <laughs> you know, two, four weeks, so let's talk again. Like, how do you approach that repentance process in yeah. an effective manner where Christ can enter and heal? It is a super complicated little dance, right? I have often in my own trying, my own attempts to think about repentance, I've often compared it to the doctrine of the Sabbath, which seems like a strange leap, hmm. right? But the Sabbath, the structure of the Sabbath is most of the time we are working for our own food, housing, et cetera, et cetera. We work, we labor, and we have these things. The Sabbath forces us every few days to stop and recognize none of this is there because of me, mm. right? All of this is a gift. Everything here is genuinely coming from God. Repentance, I think, really ought to feel something like that. It's not that repentance, we've done X, Y, Z bad things. And I've got to like eliminate those bad things, right? Get them off the, off my register or something like that. Instead, it's that every one of those acts or the things where I've gone astray are places where I have begun to think this is me. This is all about me. This mm -hmm. is about my own pleasures, my own interests, my own labor, my own glory. And really what I have to do is learn to stop like a Sabbath, right? Stop and recognize this is God. This is God. And since I've thought about it that way, <laughs> What that's looked like for me sitting in a bishop's seat, at least, is I'm watching to see when I can see that someone is feeling that way about God, right? Are they looking at the situation and thinking, I've done enough, right? I've done the things I'm supposed to do to call this repentance. My gosh, why can't I? Or is the attitude something like, my heavens, this is God. Why would I have run from God? Mm -hmm. And when I can see the attitude in the right place, then it feels this we're in the right space, right? Yeah. And is it sort of a matter of helping the, that individual who's in your office 
get to that perspective yeah. rather than just beating themselves up, right? That totally. What they've done. I, my experience so far, which is still very limited, is that more people will come into my office beating themselves up than needing repentance. Right? Yeah, right. More people come in just laden down with guilt that they just need to be able to let go, that they are trying, they are striving, they want to do right, and they're struggling, but they really mostly need someone to say, God is so good. You have no idea how much he's ready to forgive. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, are there specific, I mean, certain scriptures you come back to when you're talking about repentance with somebody or ministering to somebody in that cadence? Are there certain scriptures you find yourself coming back to again and again? That's a good question. I don't know. Part of the, maybe one of the dangers of being a religion professor and a leader <laughs> is that I've got a big long list of things right, to yeah. talk about. So a lot of things come to mind in the moment. But no, I mean, yeah, I don't know if there's any one. If there's anything I've used more than others, it may be Ether 12, where Moroni is really wrestling with his weakness Mm. and God's very direct response. I mean, ironically, here's Moroni saying, like, please, please, like, help me that I'm, you know, I'm weak. I don't know what to do here. And God, instead of saying something like, you're good enough, don't worry, says, of course you're weak. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Of course you're pathetic. (laughs) That's how you're made. Let's get over that. Yeah. Now, what can we do? So that's a passage perhaps I've turned to a, a bit more often, but no, yeah. I don't know if I've had a kind of, here's the one that seems to work or land. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. So I was talking to another uh, CES guy that was in the Education Week lectures of yours with me. And I was talking about, you know, I'd love to figure out a way to get Joseph Spencer on my podcast. He's like, just just tell him to talk about leadership in the Book of Mormon. He'll know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, because you've written a lot about the Book of Mormon, uh-huh. Nephi, is, is especially, at least from my experience, what I'm mm-hmm. familiar with, is there, I mean, and most members of the church, I mean, we all love the Book of Mormon, but what is that relationship with the Book of Mormon for you? Like, it's a, there's a deep passion there. Yeah, the Book of Mormon's my baby, which was kind of an accident. That sounds strange. But um, <laughs> what I mean is, when I first began working on Latter-day Saint topics on the side of doing philosophy, I was working on everything. I'm doing things on the Bible, I'm doing things on church history, and so I'm kind of dabbling. But the first couple of things that sort of got attention, I guess you could say, the first couple of things I published that people kind of said, whoa, that would change how we talk about things, were all about the Book of Mormon. And as a result, I got pigeonholed pretty quick. (laughs) Sort of like, whoa, okay, I'm really contributing something here. And these other things are interesting to me, but I don't know how interesting they are to others. And so I found my way to working on the Book of Mormon more and more and more and more. But man, I love it. It's, it's the book that keeps on giving. And, um, and it's the book that, this may sound strange, it's the book that we have only barely begun to read. Yeah, We've got 2,000 years of people reading the Bible seriously. We've got historians coming out of our ears in this church. And they're lovely people. That sounded like I was dismissing them. <laughs> but they've given us so much context for understanding the doctrine and covenants. We've got, for how small the Pearl of Great Price is, there's an amazing amount of work being done on it. The Book of Mormon has had you know, decades of good scholarship dedicated to it. But so much of what's been done has been just trying to give us evidence that the thing is ancient. And that's crucial work. Yeah. But so little work has been done on just saying, so what does the book actually say? And so it feels like there's just wide open space to play in. And yeah. man, it's fun. Yeah. And so, and this is, I'm, it's my job to ask impossible questions. So here, <laughs> sure. here it comes. But what did we as Latter-day Saints what would you say we, we generally just miss about the, or, or misinterpret about the Book of Mormon when we go to it and, and read and try and connect with the divine? I actually think that question's pretty easy to answer because I think we're good at connecting with the divine mm-hmm. when we read the Book of Mormon. What we're not good at is sort of twofold and they're connected. We're not good at asking what the Book of Mormon itself is actually saying. We mm-hmm. tend to use the Book of Mormon to connect through it to God, which thank the heavens we do, yeah, right? Yeah. But if that's all we do, I mean, I can imagine like, I'm having a conversation with President Oaks, and he gave a talk in the last conference, and I say, I really enjoyed your talk. I felt the spirit, and I learned this thing about myself. And he's like, good, but also, did you hear what I said? Yeah. <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh, no, I didn't care about that. It's just- I, <laughs> But I felt really good in the yeah. moment, right? Yeah. I would think President Oaks would be like, good. Now, also, here's what I said. I'm called as a prophet, seer, and revelator for a reason, right? Mm. And I think we often do this to the Book of Mormon. I got my nugget of spiritual feeling and truth and confirmation that I needed but also, did I have, do I have any idea what King Benjamin said? So I think we're kind of bad at that, at staying with it long enough to hear what the text is actually saying. And then connected to that, here's the second thing, and I think this is the thing we're really bad at. We're bad at getting the big picture mm. in the Book of Mormon. We're so focused on a verse or a passage, and we've kind of trained ourselves to read that way, right? 
read a few minutes, read a few verses. As soon as you get something that really connects with you, stop, journal. And these are wonderful practices. Right, yeah. None of this is to criticize that. But the result is that we don't tend to get a big picture. When I teach my Book of Mormon classes, I'll ask my students, so what's the point of the Book of Mosiah? And they look at me like, that's the craziest question you could possibly <laughs> ask. Well, Mormon started and stopped here for a reason, and he called it something. And so what's the point? No idea. No yeah. idea even where to begin. That's very hard for us to do. We just don't yeah. think that way about the Book of Mormon. So this, I think, we just miss mounds and mounds of insight and understanding. Yeah. So that feels a little counterintuitive that you said earlier as far as slowing down and making yeah. sure reading, but also grabbing that big picture. And I think that's yeah. what I took away you know, from that uh, Education Week course. So how do you, are those compartmentalized that there's some, mom- some days that you just need to slow down and, and take a, a column of text? And then there's other days of just standing back and saying, yeah, why is Mosiah, the book of Mosiah there? And, and what was Mormon thinking? Or Yeah, I think they're actually connected nicely, right? So For me, at least, the first time I stumbled on big picture stuff in the Book of Mormon, I was doing ridiculously slow reading. My wife and I spent about a year and a half reading from 1 Nephi 1 through 1 Nephi 19. It was insane, but we were having a lot of fun. We're newlyweds. We can study the scriptures together, and we're just like literally like, we're not going to move on from this line until we've said something interesting about it, right? And just Mm -hmm. talking back and forth, and we're taking notes. And it was when we got to chapter 19, doing this kind of slow reading, that we were like, what is Nephi saying here? Because he seems to be saying that later on he's going to do something. And where, when does he do that? And so we start digging around and, oh, well, he's anticipating this moment that comes later. And boy, if you take, oh, he's telling us something about the structure of his record. Caught us completely off guard. And that was the first moment I sort of saw, oh, there's a big picture. But I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't been reading super slowly. So there's, they kind of feed into each other. If I ask, what's the structure of the book of Mosiah? Or what's the whole point of the book of Mosiah? I can't answer that without reading pretty slowly. Mm. So I have to go, okay, so King Benjamin first, but what's King Benjamin doing? What's the, what's the message of King Benjamin? Okay, well, let me slowly read that. And okay, there's a message here that's taking shape. Now, what does that have to do with the story of Abinadi that comes next? Or, and then you start to build something up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just approaching it from that standpoint that, again, this isn't just one big journal that they kept passing down. Like yep. Nephi and all these prophets are very intentional about, okay, I'm going to put this chapter next. And it's really important that I frame it this way. But sometimes we're just like, oh, he's talking about going back to Jerusalem. This is fun, right? Next story. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Story after story. Exactly. Yeah. And especially, I mean, Nephi tells us that he doesn't, and when you mentioned this earlier, right, tells us that he doesn't write a word of this until 30 years after Mm -hmm. these things have begun happening. So this is not Nephi writing in his journal at night, (laughs) right? (laughs) Because then, yeah, it would be just sort of, this is what happens next. This is what happens next. He's shaping this. I mean, one little example there, just for fun that struck me just recently. I taught a course just on First Nephi here at BYU uh, last fall, which is a, a ridiculous amount of fun. Uh, <laughs> and one of the things we stumbled on is that when Nephi tells the story of the dream, Lehi's dream, very famous passage, right? Everyone knows it. He opens that story with a phrase he doesn't use anywhere else in his book. He says, while my father tarried in the wilderness, he had this dream. Everywhere else he says, and after that happened, then, so he breaks the sequence, like the chronological sequence here. So then we started asking, did this happen next? Is Nephi like taking something from somewhere else in his experience and dropping it here? Oh, yeah. And then it immediately struck us, something's missing if this were what happened next. Ishmael's family never gets mentioned in the dream or any of the conversations about the dream right afterward. This may have happened before they even went back for Ishmael's family, but mm. Nephi has extracted it and put it later. So what does that tell us about Nephi's purpose if he feels like the dream has to come here? Oh, the story right before it maybe is setting up and all kinds of things start to pop out. So yeah, th- this really is, it's carefully done. Mm-hmm. These people, uh, these prophets, guided by inspiration, spent serious time deciding where things go, yeah. what will tell the right story. And it sounds like a lot of that, really paying attention to the transitions of of things or stories or yep. or books of saying, like, how did they transition that and why did they do that? Yep. You know, they're, they're guiding us on a journey here, right? Totally. Yeah. All right. So leadership in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Uh, Captain Moroni, right? Is that where we right. are? That's where we always think, right? <laughs> so uh, where would you start when we, when we consider the concept of leadership in the Book of Mormon? Because it's all throughout there. And I hope this spurs you on to writing a whole, a whole series <laughs> of books about leadership in the Book of Mormon. That's but right. Anyways, where, where um, would you start? I mean, I think the, the places people tend to want to go, and I'm mean, Captain Moroni, right? We think of Captain Moroni as a kind of great leader. Hugh Nibley very famously gave a kind of explosive commencement address at BYU once upon a time called Leaders to Managers, the, yeah. fa- the Fateful Shift, and focused on Captain Moroni. I think people tend to think of Alma the Younger, who leads the church all through the book of Alma, at least until he disappears in chapter 45. And these are, I think there's a great deal to learn from these figures. I'd want to turn though to people that we might think of as leaders, but 
I think what they show us about leadership is maybe a bit more surprising. So I'd want to talk about Nephi and Jacob. And the reason I'm interested here, I mean, I think we think of Nephi as a leader. Yeah. But we tend to think of Nephi as a leader who didn't get followed much, right? Yeah. Uh, Nephi, he's supposed to be leading and he's trying and he's doing some things very right, obviously, but his brothers don't follow suit. And Jacob, clearly a leader of some sort, but in a time when it seems like the whole people is going astray. So part of what I want to, I would want to think about with leadership in the Book of Mormon is not just what are the sort of clear, obvious, good examples, but what does it look like when leaders are struggling? Because if anyone else is having my experience, <laughs> right? Yeah. This is what it looks like when you're sitting in that saddle. Yeah, that's interesting, and and uh, because I guess uh, like Nephi, that you know he kept trying to lead, but he and that's where we sort of default to this like, man, these knucklehead brothers, <laughs> yep. they just get on, you know, on 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 board here and and move forward, and so. Are there certain principles or or passages that come to mind as far as like this is this is a leadership moment or a leadership uh, struggle that that Nephi's facing? So big picture is how I like to think, right? That's so right. one of the things I think is really striking here is both Nephi and Jacob they have control of the story, right? Thinking of Hamilton there for a suddenly suddenly for a moment, right? <laughs> Who tells your story? This matters, right? Yeah. And Nephi tells his own story, and he's had a lot of time to think about it, as we've already mentioned. Jacob tells his own story. They can tell the story however they want. I mean, granted, they're prophets, God's involved, but they can shape it, they can design it, they can make sure it has the right message they want and that kind of thing. So the thing that's really surprising about both of their their writings, both Nephi's two books and Jacob's book, is that they are willing to tell stories where they don't look so hot. And so these are the passages that really I find fascinating. If Nephi's telling us a story and giving us a kind of portrait of himself as a leader, why doesn't he always look great, <laughs> right? Yeah. We tend to make him look great. I think we as readers want to make sure he's always always above the fray or something like that. Yeah. But these, uh, these two constantly give us a glimpse of what it looks like to be a leader who isn't necessarily hitting all the, the right points. Yeah. Yeah. And my mind goes to, you know, second Nephi 4, where you just, you can just, you just want to sit and weep with, with Nephi, Absolutely. you know, as he, as he break, you know, talks about just his wrestle and struggle, right? And, exactly. And so what is it, is there a, sense of like vulnerability in his leadership that is effective yeah. or that it's just real or? Well, I don't know how much vulnerability there was when he was actually leading, but in the story he tells us, yeah, right? Yeah. He's a vulnerable storyteller. And I think if we read him carefully, instead of reading him through the lens of our primary lessons or something like that from way back when, or cartoons we may have watched once upon a time, <laughs> we can start to see that he's, he really is a kind of vulnerable st storyteller. Maybe I'll start with Jacob because I think he does it in a really straightforward way. So Jacob tells us the story about his encounter with Sherem right? This is Jacob chapter seven. And Sherem is an antichrist figure. He's going around and criticizing and he wants to talk to Jacob. We should already be raising questions, I think, from the beginning here, because it takes him a while to find Jacob. This can't be a terribly big civilization yet. <laughs> so mm. is Jacob in hiding? What's gone on such that Jacob, despite being the leader of their religious practices, is not accessible? Makes you wonder exactly what stories we don't have there. But Jacob has to be sought out. Finally, Sherem meets him and they have this confrontation. And the moment here that is really striking, I'll actually turn to the text so we get yeah. wording really carefully. So uh, Sherem accuses him, you've led, led away, uses the word led, right? Led away much of this people. They pervert the right way of God. They keep not the law of Moses, which is the right way. And you convert the law of Moses into the worship of a being, which he say shall come many hundred years hence. He calls this blasphemy. And they start to debate whether a Christ can come. You can't know things to come and so on. These are familiar arguments. Eventually. Jacob just testifies in terms of the Holy Ghost, right? So this is verse 12 of Jacob 7. He says, I have heard and seen, and it also has been made manifest unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost. And Sherem's response says, to say, show me a sign by this power of the Holy Ghost. And here's the striking moment. Jacob tells us that he said this, and this is now verse 14, what am I that I should tempt God to show unto thee a sign in the thing which thou knowest to be true, yet thou wilt deny it, because thou art of the devil? Nevertheless, not my will be done, but if God shall smite thee, let that be a sign. And so on. This is a striking moment, I think, because a few moments later, a sign comes. Sherem is struck and he's nourished for a time. And then he's going to die and he gathers, has the people gathered and confesses. So you get this in verse 17. He spake plainly unto them and denied the things which he had taught them and confessed the Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost and the ministering of angels. So what's so striking here is that Jacob tells us he got it wrong, right? Mm. Just straight up tells us he got it wrong. I told Sherem, you'll deny it, even if you had a sign. He gets a sign and he denied what he had taught mm. and confessed the Christ, confessed the Holy Ghost, the ministering of angels. Jacob has control of the narrative as storyteller. He could tell us, look, he said a bunch of dumb stuff. I wiped the floor with him. We moved on. God is yeah. good, <laughs> right? 
But he doesn't. He says, I told him you'll deny it. He didn't deny it. And that's a pretty remarkable yeah. way of telling the story. When he has complete control of how we will see him, he lets us see him get something wrong about his enemy. And it's clear, sherem has got problems, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Sherem's not the good guy here, but Jacob's not completely the good guy either. And he's willing to put that on display. Yeah. So um, is that sort of trait, and it makes me wonder, like, maybe it was how they were parented or something that yeah. they, they have these traits or just was in their DNA or whatever. But is that, are these, is that type of experience unique in the Book of Mormon to these two prophets? Or I don't think so, though. At least I assume it isn't. I don't know if we have enough data. And the reason I say that is because once we get past these small plates, Mormon's telling the story. Yeah. Uh, and Mormon gives us just a few chapters of his own autobiography and not a lot of actual content about him, like mm-hmm. his own story. It's mostly people are fighting and so on and so forth. So we don't get a lot of opportunities to see how this might play out again. Only here do we have autobiographical writings where Jacob can show us himself as a leader. Mormon later can show us Captain Roni as a leader or Alma as a leader. But these are kind of unique moments because they themselves have control of their narrative and they're willing to show us something pretty vulnerable. Yeah. You talk about, you know, this is their story that they're telling and and you know, I simply, you know, in the in the primary years of our our faith development, it's easy to simplify the scripture and Book of Mormon as if, you know, God is like whispering in their ears right. and then they are writing it on the tablets yeah. and then now we're translating and this is these are God's words. And and I love just the humanness in it, the because sometimes I'll read Jacob and I'm like you know, if I prepared a, d- a discourse or a talk about these doctrine points that you're talking about, I'd be much, I would be a lot softer and you're sort of going overboard here. And I don't, I don't necessarily agree with how you're framing everything. Right? right. But then there's a guilty part of me like, Hey Kurt, this is like scripture. Like you can't question <laughs> right. how Jacob is laying this out. But at the same time, I sort of want that push and pull with, as I explore, you know, that big picture, I guess. Right. And so I'm just, it goes to the principle of like autonomy as leaders, like God just saying like, yeah, I want you to write about some things, but you're writing it. I'm not writing it. You're writing it. Is that, uh, yeah. I, to me, that's because I see that a lot in the in leadership, even in the church where leaders, bishops are petrified of making a choice without a clear spiritual prompting of direction of what they should say and do. And so then they think, well, I just got to wait then. I got to wait till that comes. It's like, no, you've been you've been set apart with keys. Like those are governing keys. Go for it. Right. And so right. I, I'm intrigued by that concept of autonomy. What, what thoughts come to mind? Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, and I think that's, that's exactly what's on display is that they, they sort of show themselves often having to take a step, right? Step in the dark and are willing to say sometimes they took the wrong step Yeah, and God was with them. Yeah. Right. So I'm trying to think of another sort of nice example of something like that. So here's one, the story of Nephi going back to get the plates is riddled with this kind of stuff, I think, in really interesting ways. One moment that I find very interesting, they've had their first attempt to get the plates, right? Layman goes in, just asks for them, gets chased out. And Nephi says, my brothers, we're about to go back. Okay, we gave it a shot. We're going home. Not home. We're going back to the desert. And uh, and Nephi says, well, so I spoke up. And and as he speaks up, it's a really interesting passage in about 50 ways. But he, uh, as he speaks up and says, look, we're going to go, we're going to do these things, blah, blah, blah. Dad left all this wealth behind, blah, blah, blah. Along the way, he says, like, it's wisdom in God that we get these plates. And he starts to explain the reasons they need to get the plates. And he lays out like three or four of them. The question I have as a reader is, so Nephi, where'd you get those ideas? Like, where are these reasons coming from, right? (laughs) Uh, No one before, Lehi didn't say any of that stuff when he gave you the commission. We don't have any reason to believe that Nephi is yet anything like a prophet. He doesn't claim this came from God in the moment. Mm. It actually looks like Nephi making things up on the fly to convince his brothers. And I think Nephi is in fact trying to portray it that way. Sort of like, I needed them to do this. I knew God wanted us to get the plates. I didn't know what to say. So I started making things up, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I was willing to kind of go out on a limb and be like, well, here are some wise reasons to have these plates. And I don't think anything he says is false, but he's willing to say, this was me speaking. This was me trying to reason and persuade with whatever I had in me without God having to come down and say, here's why you must get the plates. So I think Nephi shows us himself stepping out into the unknown sometimes and just having to reason a bit with his own faculties hmm. without a clear, direct sense of of what God is up to. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. What would you say as far as um, the Laman and Lemuel Nephi relationship as far as leadership? Because sometimes a leader 
struggles with those they lead or why don't you listen to me? I'm, I'm in charge here. Don't you know that? Or, you know, anything we could learn from that dynamic or things we misunderstand about that dynamic? I think quite a bit. Yeah. We tend to think of Laman and Lemuel and this is, I'll blame this on cartoons and uh, <laughs> primary lessons a little, right? I think it's important early in our life to get a kind of clear black and white picture. We got to start somewhere and get a sense of morality and those kinds of things. But at some point, I hope we get a kind of more grown up version of Nephi and his brothers. Because the picture I see here is one where Nephi is tracing the process by which he became alienated and his brother, really the process by which his brothers became alienated from him. And as you already pointed out, when he gets to this Psalm in 2 Nephi 4, he's lamenting. Yeah, I think we often read that and just go, wow, Nephi is really worried about his own sins. Pause, right? Like, what does he talk about the most in there? Like five times he mentions his enemies and the first right before he starts the poem and right after he starts the poem, he talks about calling unto God because of his fights with his brothers. When he says enemies, he means the only two enemies he's got, right? Yeah. Laman and Lemuel. This poem is him going, what have I done? Have I been too hard? Have I pushed them away? How could I have held on to them? Like Nephi is, the story he's telling us is not, I want to show you what idiots do and don't be like them. He's saying, how on earth do you do this careful dance of keeping somebody in while holding serious about obedience in such a way that we can stay united? And even with all Nephi has tried to learn and maybe failed to learn, God will still be good. He will recall them in the last days, right? We'll get prophecies mm -hmm. of recovery and redemption and so on. God can still fix this problem in the end, but uh, Nephi himself perhaps couldn't. Yeah. And I guess it's similar to that, the Jacob five of sort of the, the lamenting that's happening in there as well. Right? Absolutely. And again, to put it into context that like, I think sometimes we read those chapters like, oh, Nephi just got in a fight with his brothers. He went to his tent and he's frustrated. And so he started writing. <laughs> totally. but this is 30 years in the future. And there's sort of this moment of like, I'm going to try and articulate just how difficult it was to be the leader, to be the prophet, to, totally. to do these things. And it hurt my soul. You yeah. Know? And I think every leader has that moment, especially maybe as they're transitioning out where they think, man, there was probably something more I could do. I was just so weak. I should have tried harder, right? right. Like, and, and I relied too much on maybe my flesh and, and I shouldn't have. Right? Exactly. And I think Nephi worries, especially that he was too hard, that mm -hmm. he was too harsh and that maybe it was too easy for him to let his own interests and his own sense of self get in the way. So maybe I'll point to a couple of passages where I think that's on display. So my favorite one, because I think it's just a little funny, and I think Nephi's maybe even trying to be a bit humorous. We don't tend to laugh at the Book of Mormon, but I think <laughs> once in a while it is trying to be funny. But this is the moment, this is in First Nephi 7. Nephi's brothers are, they've tied him up and they leave him for beasts, right? They're done with him. This is after they've gotten the family of Ishmael. And uh, they're going to leave him to be eaten by animals and so on. And then it says, Nephi tells us, I prayed that it, give me strength that I may burst these bands but with which I'm bound. And then he says, after I had prayed, my bands were loosed from off me. And I think we don't think about the, the difference between his prayer and its answer hard mm -hmm. enough. We tend to just go, see, he got answered, good, he's back to work. But I think what we have here is Nephi going, I was like, God, give me power. I'm going to burst these bands. It's going to be this show of strength and my brothers will bow. And God's like, no, 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 this is not what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> right? We're just poof, off they go, get back to work. And I think Nephi is trying to show us, this is what my youthful faith sometimes looked like. I thought this was about me having authority and power and control. And then God kind of shut me up a little. Yeah. The other story where I think this is on display kind of nicely, it's the same we were talking about a moment ago where Nephi seems to be sort of making up explanations of why they need to get the plates. And I think he's trying to tell us, like, I was taking guesses. I was throwing spaghetti on the wall to see if mm -hmm. it would stick. And he's tried and they go up and it fails, right? They go up a second time. They trade all this stuff for the plates. They get nothing. They're chased out. They're almost dying. They're now in a cave. It's really bad. Laman and Lemuel are beating Nephi and Sam. And then an angel shows up to deliver them. But one thing that's very striking about that angel's appearance. So this is, an, I'm going to get the passage out. Yeah. So this is the end of First Nephi 3. So the angel has shown up. This is what the angel says. Why do you smite your younger brother with a rod? Know ye not that the Lord hath chosen him to be a ruler over you, and this because of your iniquities. That's a really striking passage if you pause and think about it. Nephi has been promised just a chapter earlier in modern chaptering, 1 Nephi chapter 2, that he would become a ruler and a teacher over his brothers, right? Here, when the angel shows up, he's, he, all he says to Laman and Lemuel is, don't you know he's been chosen to be a ruler over you? He drops the word teacher, mm. which I think Nephi would hear loud, loud and clear. And I think the story Nephi is telling us here is, I tried to be a teacher. And then an angel showed up and said, 
Are you sure you're that yet? Mm. <laughs> right? You got promised you'll be that. Don't jump the gun, right? Let's wait till the right moment. I'm thinking of DNC 11 telling Hiram Smith, right? Wait till you've obtained my word, then you can go talk. And this seems to be a kind of moment where Nephi portrays himself taking a stab, going out a little too far, perhaps, trying to think think he's got some answers, and then an angel showing up and, of course, stopping Laman and Lemuel from violence and telling them off, but also subtly kind of poking at Nephi. Slow down. You don't have to rush into this. You just got this calling. You don't even know, you haven't even been sustained yet, right? Yeah. <laughs> Slow down. You don't have to be everything yet. Let's do this one step at a time. So I think Nephi does a nice job at showing us over and over what it was like to grow into spiritual maturity. And yeah. we tend to read these as all these stories have got to be Nephi already getting it all. No, I think he's trying to show us the process of learning and maturation. Yeah. And and to me, I reflect that on like a personal leadership experience of just going, like it's easy to assume what our role is and our purpose in, in leading and, and leadership is such a general term, but to go to God and say, or, or, or the story meant, you know, ponder over the story thinking, what is it? Am I supposed to be a teacher in this role as a, as an elders quorum president right. or- a ruler of some capacity or like, what is my role in, in stepping into that revelation? And we, maybe God has a different, you know, role for us in, right. in these leadership callings, right? Yeah. It's too easy to assume. And it's too easy for us to just assume something that we, we draw from culture, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, kind of cheap example of this is it's so easy to give a sacrament meeting talk and follow a formula, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The bishop called me and here was my reaction. And here's the <laughs> Webster's dictionary definition of whatever term and, you know, we, there are these little formulas we use, <laughs> yeah. but part of what we're doing there is we're following a kind of socialized practice. This is what everyone does, what everyone's expected to do. And boy, that can poison us as leaders. You get called in as a leader and you're like, okay, so what does a bishop do? Who cares? What are you supposed to do? <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. What's your task right now? What is needful? What does your ward need? Or what does this person need? Not what does a bishop do? Who cares? Who cares? That's yeah. not your task. Right. Yeah. And I, and I love pushing through that next step because it's easy to sort of default. Well, the handbook says A, B, and C, so I'll do A, B, and C. But like, you know, you were called here in this area. What role and purpose do you have yeah. apart from just what the, the policies and procedures say? Yeah. In fact, and this kind of circling back to one of the questions you asked before we were talking about the Book of Mormon. But one thing that's been wonderfully surprising for me, at least as a bishop, is how often when I take something to my stake president, his response is, well, you have the keys, Bishop, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, good call. Okay, I'll get off the phone. I can get back to work, yeah. right? And that's right. Like, it's, there are handbooks. Let's, boy, let's understand this. Let's do this as best we can. And also, my heavens, the handbook had better not cover everything. Yeah. 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 And it takes me back to the reference of, you know, Nephi going out after the plates and coming up with reasons why he's, he's supposed to do that. And Maybe he did go to Lehi and say, now why, now why are we going, I'm about to make mm -hmm. a long hike here. So why are we going back? And maybe he said, Hey, you're, you're yeah. the leader. You go figure it out. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. And there's a, a great revelation in that for sure. What's the, where do we go from here as far as an, a, another concept, leadership concept in the lives of, of Nephi or Jacob or any other Book of Mormon experience? Yeah. So maybe let me dwell on a moment where I think Nephi wonders if he went too far and here, so here, maybe I, I need to just like signal we're going to read a little speculatively for okay. a few minutes. Right. So I love it. Anyone out there who's like, what? That's an apostate reading. Calm down. We're okay. <laughs> We're just going to experiment here for a few minutes. Okay. But I think, there's, I think there's real possibility here. So one of the things that strikes me as interesting. So when Nephi hears from the Lord from the first, for the first time, it's first Nephi 2, uh, he's praying about his brothers and he hears God's voice. And God makes two covenants of a sort in a row. So these are very familiar passages, but I'll read them. So this is uh, first Nephi 2 verse 20. Uh, he says, God says to Nephi, inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper and shall be led to a land of promise. And then in verse 21, he says, inasmuch as thy brethren shall rebel, then they'll be cut off from the presence of the Lord. Verse 22, inasmuch as thou shalt keep my commandments, thou shalt be made a ruler and a teacher over thy brethren. So notice twice here, we get an inasmuch as you keep my commandments. But there's a slight difference that we tend to miss. In verse 20, the Lord uses the pronoun ye, inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments. And in verse 22, he uses the pronoun thou, inasmuch as thou shalt keep my commandments. And this is maybe not as familiar as it ought to be to us, 400-year-old language, but <laughs> ye is plural in early modern English, and thou is singular. And probably what's going on here then is in verse 20, Nephi is receiving a promise for the whole group. Inasmuch as all of you keep my commandments, the promise is a land of promise and prosperity. Inasmuch as thou, you Nephi, keep my commandments, you'll be made a ruler and a teacher. So Nephi hears two things about keeping commandments, and one of them is about the whole group and what it looks like for them. 
The other is about just what it looks like individually for him. And that is hard to hold together. Mm. Man, that's hard to hold together. How does he exercise his sort of individual responsibility to God as an obedient servant and worry about everybody's obedient response to God, right? And he's got to somehow balance this. And he's a just barely waking up teenager, right? And the very next thing that happens, he says, he comes back from hearing from the Lord and Lehi says, I've had a revelation, right? A dream. And God said, you need to go back to Jerusalem. He's commanded. And he uses this word and you can hear Nephi as young kid commandment. That's the thing. That's the thing we've got to do, right? And all through the story of then going back to get the plates, this word commandment shows up over and over and over and over again. And this is this motif, right? But you can imagine that for Nephi, this is a very tangled thing. And as much as ye keep my commandments, in as much as thou shalt keep my commandments. And for Nephi, and as much as thou shalt keep my commandments, you'll be made a ruler and a teacher. It's going to be so hard for him not to hear commandment keeping is something I'm going to do because it puts me in the right place with respect to my brothers. Mm. They will follow. And the story he then tells is a story in which he is hitting this commandment thing so hard with his brothers that by the end of this very first story, there's already an alienation in the family. And I wonder if Nephi looks back and sees this as them, as him pushing harder than he should have. And the moment that then, if that's right, the moment there that's a little uncomfortable to read <laughs> is maybe the most famous verse in all of First Nephi. First Nephi 3, 7, very famously, I will go, I will do the things which the Lord hath commanded, for I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men. We might not read this just as Nephi being a kind of exemplary obedient figure. This might be Nephi going, that's right, I will go and do instead of we, right? Mm. He immediately takes this all on as a kind of unique responsibility, and then he's going to force his brothers through this. And this is his, I think this is him showing us that it took him a while to see this. The reason I think we can say this, because that might just sound like me being a kind of cynical reader, uh, <laughs> but the reason I think we can say this is that eventually he finds himself in a dark alley, all alone, standing over Laban's body, and the spirit constraining him, doesn't use the word command, which is interesting, hmm. constraining him to kill Laban. And when Nephi ar sort of argues with the spirit a bit, and the spirit uh, explains, we tend to go, oh, the spirit is explaining why it's okay to kill Laban, right? It's better that one man should perish, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. We tend to read it that way, but that's not what Nephi hears. He doesn't say, I thought, oh, I see how that works, so I killed Laban. He says, when I heard these words from the spirit, my mind went back to the words the Lord had said to me in the wilderness inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments. So I think what Nephi tells us there is, I have been, I will keep the commandments. I will keep the commandments. And now this whole mess is unfolded. He's standing over Laban's body. And now he realizes with a shock as he listens to the spirit, inasmuch as ye, this is about all of us. How have I been doing this? And I think it's almost like for the first moment, Nephi realizes that leadership is not dragging everyone through it, but <laughs> is more like, how do you build community and consensus and good feeling. And I wonder if standing over Laban's body, he's scared he's already ruined the family. Oh, wow. No, that's a heavy reading, I realize, right? <laughs> and a bit speculative because Nephi doesn't just come out and say, look, I didn't do this, right? I don't think it's that simple. I think he is, though, trying to show us the process of learning to be a leader was hard and fraught. And it took me a while to learn how to peel apart my own ego my own interests, my own desires to be a ruler and a teacher, and the really complicated work of getting a whole people on board with what God is doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, so to summarize, there was sort of this, these habit of, of Nephi saying, you know, if this needs to get done, I'll go do it. Like I, I will go and do, right? It's yeah. all on me. Like if, if it's meant to be, it's up to me or type, type of thing where it's more like, no, no, I want this to be a community effort, a community journey going yeah. together with this. And man, that is you can see examples, you know, projecting that on modern day leadership. There's those leaders that that do that, right? Totally. And maybe God has a deeper experience in that. And then on the flip side, I see some individuals who get released as a bishop after five, six years, and they've sort of lost their identity. They've sort yeah. of lost this mission of, you know, nurturing their own salvation and exaltation and, and spirituality and whatnot. And then they think, well, I don't, how do I read the scriptures if I don't have for Someone, appointments yeah, that, exactly. that I'm reading them for, you yeah. know, and so that, that's such a dynamic that to sit with and and to go through the life of Nephi with that perspective, thinking how is he maybe going too far with his leadership when he should have stepped back and saying, "Hey, let's rally the troops first. Yeah, right? and I think the beauty of that because 
I'm always nervous about this reading because I think someone can re- hear it and go, oh my gosh, you're just throwing Nephi under the bus, right? <laughs> but I think the reason it's a beautiful reading is that, again, Nephi has control of the story, right? Yeah. He could tell the story any way he wants. And the fact that he very carefully and nuanced ways shows us two different promises made to him, him privileging one of them, and then having to come to hear the other one right in a really fraught moment. Nephi is very cleverly not throwing himself under the bus, but just saying, man, this is complicated. You can't, it's not. And I think he's warning us, don't take that first Nephi 3.7 and say, good, run into the fray. I will go and do no, whoa, slow down. How does obedience work out in a way that we can all go into heaven together? That's yeah. hard. Yeah. And so helpful. To, as a, even like a word counsel to step back and say, I know that those in this room, we can get it done. Like this Christmas party or word barbecue. Yep. Everybody in this room can make sure it goes and it will go great. Yep. But how can we gather the ward and totally. do this together totally. and bless so many lives if we do that? And for me, that, I mean, boy, is that a live question? Because I'm, I'm a bishop and a ward here in Provo, what we call a family ward, right? Um, and, uh, but 50% of it is young, very recently married couples, right? BYU students who've just gotten married and moved into the ward. And we'll have them for a year. So it's a constant turnover. It can be mm-hmm. a complicated ward in some ways that way. But it's a really beautiful experience because you get this like injection of life over and over and over again. And on top of that, it means that we have the, uh, the opportunity. And I think lots of wards are like this, whether in a more transient area or wards that have a lot of uh, young married couples or whatever it is we have an opportunity to turn it into a kind of training ward, right? Mm, This is how we've learned to think about it is we have to say, we've got them for six months. Good. What can you do with someone in six months? Where of course, all of us people who own houses in this neighborhood, we could get this all done. Mm. Yeah. We could throw the event. We could have this, we can cover all these lessons. We can man all of the organizations, but what if, you know, all of your counselors are 21, (laughs) right? And what if uh, everyone that's teaching Sunday school is 22 or like these are real possibilities and we can do something way bigger than simply get it done, right? We can we can train people who will then go out all over the world and yeah. 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 And you know, you keep going back to this this concept of Nephi and Jacob, they controlled the story. Uh-huh. They they could dictate how it was laid out. And that's so empowering as a leader of because again, it, you can get sort of paralysis of I don't know, I don't want to make a decision because what if it just goes sour and, and right. everything goes belly up to so saying like, this is your story, you know, Bishop for the next five years or either elders corner for the next couple of years, like how are you going to do it? And it's so easy, especially in, as we talk about leadership principles and concepts, you know, I hear from people who are just so frustrated that their Bishop or at least their president is just, they're not doing it right. Yeah. And, and they're frustrated that it, I would do it completely different. In fact, that everybody else would, and you're doing it wrong, but saying it's their story. And so, Maybe we can find a place in that story as they write it for our ward at this time. Yeah, and, that's uh, nice. You know. Yeah, I like that. I mean, one of the reasons I like that way of thinking about what Nephi and Jacob are both doing is that we have a tendency. I mean, I don't know if uh, if you've read much of Adam Miller. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah I've Adam, interviewed him before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Adam is one of my best friends and we think a lot together and so on. And uh, in one of his earlier books, Letters to a Young Mormon. which Great book. Everybody yeah, should read it. Everyone it's should read and it's it. a quick read too. It's, it's a very yeah. quick read. And if you're worried about the title, it's a few years old. Don't yeah, worry. that's right. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a lovely book. And one of the things he does early in the book is talks about stories, right? Mm-hmm. We fall in love with our stories. We worship our stories. And uh, this is one of the things I think is beautiful about both Nephi and Jacob is they have complete charge of their story. They could tell their story however they want, and they aren't willing to tell a story in which they are perfect, mm-hmm. right? And this is, I think, one of the deepest, most insidious temptations for anyone in any position of authority. I think this is what DNC 121 is warning us against, right? Yeah. Is that we can have a temptation to make sure that as we weave a story, as we create a story for our ward or organization or whatever it is, that we have a story in which we always come out on top. And that is, I think, disastrous. And this is, I think, part of what they're trying to show us. Can you tell a story in which you are, in fact, weak, in which you have to learn, and in which you may have screwed everything up but God is still good. Yeah. God is always good. And in our faith tradition, that's sometimes a lot harder for the bishop to do as opposed to the attic in the ward, right? Absolutely. And, and uh, obviously in leadership callings and responsibilities, there's certain level of stability, both financially, spiritually, and all these things. And so you get individuals in these callings who seem like, oh, they figured it out. They they got the equation. And then we we even start believing that and saying, when someone comes to my office, I just need to give them my equation. Totally. You know, just do A plus B and then you'll be happy. So just do that. And it's so much more nuanced and complicated 
and sort of step back and think, okay, I still have a story and it might be, I might be the hardest person to figure out how to tell that story, but it's still important for me to tell yeah. it. Yeah. Right? Cause that's where redemption is. Totally. Totally. Yeah. So yeah, we have to be careful about our stories. And I think Nephi and Jacob are perfect examples there. And it's worth saying, like, we're emphasizing leadership here, but my heavens, this is parenting. <laughs> oh, yeah. The worst way to be a parent is to tell yourself a story constantly in which you're a great parent. <laughs> you want to ruin your kids? <laughs> tell that story to yourself over and over, right? You have to be willing to say, I am not, I have no idea what I'm yeah. doing. And then you might do something right. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, any other principle or concept uh, that we haven't hit on that you want to make sure we, we include? I mean, I'll just uh, point to one other text in the Book of Mormon that I think captures all of this beautifully. And we actually mentioned it earlier when you asked what passages I share with people most often. And I mentioned Ether 12, where Moroni is wrestling with his weakness. I think there, just in a single passage, Moroni captures all of this. And I shouldn't say Moroni, the Lord does in responding yeah, to Moroni, yeah. right? But when Moroni is like, oh, we're weak, we can't write, we're not going to do this, the Gentiles are going to take advantage of all this stuff. And God's beautiful response is, yeah, you're weak. Yeah, that was a gift right? Yeah. I give you weakness so that you'll be humble. And then anyone who recognizes that, right? Who just gives in to the fact that they are weak. Those are those for whom grace is sufficient. And that seems to, I think, sum up all of this. The second we think that we have to tell a story in which we are always strong, or the second in which we think that what it is to be a leader is to be strong on every count. I drag everyone with me. That's when we do it wrong. Instead, we've got to be something like Moroni, terrible at writing and yet putting together a thing that's going to redeem the whole world, willing to seal the thing up and bury it and leave it and Ugh. trust the Gentiles won't ruin everything. Right. Yeah. Like that's what real leadership I think looks like from the Book of Mormon's perspective. Uh, that's powerful. All right. So I'm going to ask you the typical question I ask, but I'm going to ask you two ways. One is if I was uh, interviewing Nephi and you don't need to speak in the voice of Nephi or anything, but uh, if I was to sit down with Nephi and ask him, what has your time as a leader, how is your time as a leader how has it helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? How do you think he would respond to that? Boy, that's a great question. I mean, it is striking that in 2 Nephi 31, Nephi is now wrapping up his whole record. And there he's talking about baptism. Why was Christ baptized, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer he gives is that Christ was setting an example. And he quotes the father saying, anyone who hearkens to the voice of my son will be saved. And then he says, and I heard the voice of the son saying, follow thou me. So it's really quite a striking thing that Nephi will end his whole record by saying, Jesus is the leader, right? Following him, that's the task, very specifically. And what Christ came down to do was precisely to put on display what this looks like. So I wonder if Nephi would say that, in fact, the more I'm thinking about this, just on my feet, we're sitting down. Uh, <laughs> the more I'm thinking about this, the more I think this is, uh, this is precisely what Nephi would have to say. So I'll, I'll give a longer answer than you probably wanted on this question. No, that's fine. In 1 Nephi 11, Nephi has this vision of Christ's life, the life of the Lamb. And uh, one of the first things the angel says to Nephi as he's watching all this stuff unfold is, knowest thou the condescension of God? And I think we tend to read that and go, oh, he's talking about Christ coming down and being born, right? In a mere mortal flesh and just a baby and so on. Because the next thing Nephi sees is Jesus being born. But I don't think that's actually what the angel means by the condescension of God. And the re reason I say that is a few verses on, the angel now says, look and behold the condescension of God. And the next thing Nephi sees, Jesus has already been born. The next thing Nephi sees is Jesus getting baptized. And it's this that Nephi ref returns to at the end of his book. So I think the angel is trying to say when Christ is willing to submit to the Father and undergo this ritual that won't save him because he is salvation. When Christ does this, that is the condescension of God. So what does it look like to follow Christ is to see him as leader. And what is he as leader? He is willing to bow before the Father, right? Mm -hmm. He's willing to give up on his own strength, set that aside, come and submit even to something like baptism, even though baptism is just a symbol of the stuff he does, right? Yeah. And that itself is a pretty remarkable example of the very same things we've been talking about. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. All right. Now we're coming back to your story, the story you're in control of. <laughs> uh, as you reflect on your time as a leader, whether it's these nine months or Elsewhere in other leadership capacities, both formal and informal, how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? I mean, if, uh, maybe above all, getting into the saddle means you realize just how little you know, right? And th that's been my experience here just in these last months, but maybe the first time I experienced this and just floored me was as a missionary, right? Getting out there and going, I know nothing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what on earth am I doing? Why would God put 19-year-old kids in charge of anything? Yeah. But there, I think I began to realize, 
yeah, just how crucial it was not to know anything so that I could have so much more compassion for everyone else, right? So this is perhaps what above all I feel helps me in following Christ is as I get into positions of leadership, it's not that I learn great principles and so on about, oh, now I know what everyone should do. It's I get in there and realize, man, we are all fools before God. (laughs) And my heavens, I need a lot more patience. I need a lot more compassion, which is what Christ showed through his whole life. That concludes this episode of the Leading Saints podcast. We'd love to hear from you about your questions or thoughts or comments. You can either leave a comment on the uh, post related to this episode at leadingsaints.org or go to leadingsaints.org slash contact and send us your perspective or questions. If there's other episodes or topics you'd like to hear on the Leading Saints podcast, go to leadingsaints.org slash contact and share with us the information there. And we would love for you to share this with any individual you think this would apply to, especially maybe individuals in your ward council or other leaders that you may know who would really appreciate the perspectives that we discussed. Remember, solve the burden of meetings by visiting leadingsaints.org slash 14 and getting 14 days access to the Meetings with Saints virtual library. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness. The loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away, and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.